A very warm good morning to all of you. Once again, I welcome you all to this short-term training program of Nahev Cast. So most awaited moment is over now. So uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. C. Vishwanathan with us. He is coordinator, School of Basic Science, and his introduction doesn't require any, uh, like he doesn't require any brief introduction because uh, he is uh, not a scientist of Indian fame but international repute. He has published a lot of papers in different peer-reviewed journals and uh, like Nature, Science, etc., etc. And he has handled more than uh, 12 big mega projects. And this uh, World Bank funded project, this is one of them. And Sir is like a teacher, a guru, and he is an epitome or blend of not only a good teacher, but a good researcher and good administrator also. So with this brief note, now I request Vishnathan Sir to please present, but before that we'll do one customary. So I request Kavita to please welcome Sir with a flower bird. Thank you so much. So today, sir, is going to present on one of the recent uh, uh, technique that is phenomics. So hope you all will enjoy this talk, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ranjan, uh, for uh, the nice introduction. So uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, today, uh, I'll be briefly discussing about uh, the phenomics. You all might have so much heard about uh, the next generation genotyping. So today we will briefly see about uh, the next generation phenotyping technologies. So uh, this slide you might have seen uh, several times, but still it is important uh, for you to remember uh, this. Uh, the major challenges faced by agriculture is the population. So when the population increases, we have to produce food and nutritionally uh, enhanced food so that we are uh, a healthy population. And this, uh, achieving this challenge in the past also we have achieved the food security, but now the challenges are more because the natural resources are uh, decreasing and uh, environmental sustainability is an issue and global climate change adds to the worries. And uh, the farmer's income is one of the most debated issues in the recent past because their income is very low, many of uh, them are not uh, uh, willing to continue farming because the sustainability issue. So we have to address all these uh, challenges. So when uh, challenges are there and uh, the uh, United Nations has developed uh, some goals for uh, 2030, like by 2030 we have to achieve zero hunger, which means you have to provide food and nutritionally enhanced food. So this responsibility uh, mainly lies with agricultural scientists because you have to uh, produce more food, healthy food under the challenging environment. So what are uh, the tools that are available that can be used for enhancing uh, the productivity uh, is, uh, we'll see one of them is uh, phenomics. So we will discuss about uh, the uh, plant phenomics. So uh, uh, there is in the last two decades, lot of information has been generated about genomics. Now uh, you can produce a genome sequence at a cheaper cost. So what to do with the genome sequence? So these are uh, some of the uh, vision that is decadal vision in USA different uh, science academies are there. In India also we have different science academies. Similar to that in US science academies, they met in uh, 2013 and they uh, thought what should be the major goal for uh, the plant science research. So one of the uh, goal is the increase the ability to predict plant traits from plant genome in diverse environment. That is once you sequence, so you know the sequence information, from that you have to predict the plant trait. And also you have to predict the plant trait different environment. And I am not sure that within uh, 2025 we will be able to do it, but effort is on to try the maximum possible to achieve towards this goal. So this goal is directly related to people, those who are working in agriculture, because we have to do this for sustaining the food production and the nutritionally uh, uh, good quality food while sustaining the environment. So then once you predict, then uh, the next comes assemble the plant right in a desirable way to solve any problem, whether increase in the productivity or resources efficiency or nutritional quality stress tolerance. So whatever problem is there, you have to solve by assembling the trait. 
And then uh, this all comes with like now a lot of data is being generated. So, you have to use that data to find solution uh, to this problem. Lot of genomes is, are being sequenced. Uh, you know, in the earth biome sequence, we are going to sequence several uh, species. So, how this all the genome information can be utilized to derive this relationship. So, if you want to identify what is the relations between the genome sequence and uh, the plant rate. So, conventionally we uh, do uh, a QTL mapping or association analysis or some functional genomics to decipher the function of small, small sequences. So, it takes a uh, lot of time. Yeah, among uh, various tools used in this, uh, the phenotyping is one of the tool that is most time consuming that is a rate limiting step. So, we already uh, know that what is a gene and what is a genotype and what is the phenotype. So, phenotype is although many times we might have not read the definition, it is the set of structural, physiological and performance related trait of a genotype in a given environment. So, phenotyping is nothing new, conventionally we do it from the time immemorial uh, phenotyping is being done for various purpose, it is the measurement of a set of uh, pheno phenotype. So, from the uh, uh, time of domestication, we are uh, doing phenotyping. So, based on that only uh, different uh, out of the uh, large number of plant species which have people have selected some species and while doing cultivation also they tried uh, several methods. So, phenotyping so that they can optimize the uh, cultivation condition and later uh, when the uh, systematic uh, genetic improvement started earlier uh, uh, this crop improvement program it was mainly relied on the phenotypic selection that is you see the phenotype and then you select to improve the genotype. So, then later came in uh, the functional genomics and then this helped uh, assembly of desired uh, traits uh, by uh, various means and then molecular bedding helps the program uh, to be very faster. So, in addition to the crop improvement program now uh, this is very important area in agriculture that is the crop management, how we can use uh, phenotyping and uh, 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 computer uh, science in the crop management. So, this involves lot of uh, phenotyping work that is you have to do phenotyping, phenotyping in the real time that is you see the crop and you have to tell the health of the crop. So, for that a uh, lot of uh, high precision and high throughput uh, phenotyping is required. So, that immediately uh, you can uh, see the crop and tell what inputs are needed or what uh, measurements are uh, needed to protect the crop. Besides uh, crop cultivation, even uh, the post harvest handling, grading and quality monitoring, their storage monitoring, many things require accurate phenotyping. So, in the cross, uh, crop protection aspect, you have to measure uh, all these traits in the field in real time, so that you can provide a decision to the farmer. That is, you have to monitor uh, all the nutrient level, not only in the soil, but also in the plant and what are the insect. Uh, and other pathogens that are going to attack or already if it is there what measures has to be taken. So, many of these things require continuous monitoring of crop health as well as soil health to provide uh, solutions. In the post harvest a uh, lot of uh, efforts are being made to use uh, the phenotyping methods either for grading or even for harvesting. So, phenotyping is that is why it is uh, central to uh, many of the uh, uh, aspects which we are discussing and conventionally we do phenotyping uh, and end point phenotyping that is we uh, grow the crop and finally, we see what is the yield. So, that itself is uh, okay like if you uh, have uh, want to select a plant with higher yield, it is okay we can use that method to select it, but the limitation is we will not be able to know what is the cause for that yield. That is same yield can be achieved by different components. Say for example, I have given several genes. So, maybe in one uh, genotype the yield may be because of a particular component uh, of the uh, yield contributing factors. So, if you know in rice about 40,000 genes are there. So, different combinations can give the same yield and its interaction can also give the same yield. So, if you want to uh, know uh, how each uh, 
gene is contributing to a specific component trait, you have to do a deep phenotyping. That is, besides measuring yield, you have to measure at every time point of time, even from starting from the germination, the rate of germination and the rate at which plant it grows, the amount of leaf area produced and within the leaf, what is the photosynthesis and all the biochemical pathway which you are reading. So, everything has to be phenotyped, then only you will be able to assemble different mechanism that is in one genotype a particular gene is involved in other genotype may be other gene is limiting. When you assemble all these uh, genes you can produce a better uh, genotype. So, this is just an example I have given. So, a different genotype can produce same amount of biomass. So, when you measure uh, the end point phenotyping we will not be able to capture what is the genomic region that is giving this particular amount of biomass because in every case uh, the contributing factor may be different. So, that is why you have to continuously monitor uh, the phenotype which needs new methods, the conventional methods are not sufficient. So, with the advent of uh, the next generation uh, genotyping method, the genotyping has become uh, easy, but we are unable to assign function to each of the gene or each of the uh, uh, gene sequence. And in a specific environment that is also very, very important that is you know the function of the gene in one environment it may contribute to the trait and uh, 50 percent in other environment it may contribute to 70 percent and the rest of the 25 percent or 50 percent can come from the environment. So, we should understand how uh, the genotype interact with the environment and produce a phenotype. So, this again uh, require uh, dynamic phenotyping that is one time point phenotyping is not sufficient. Although the genotype is a constant that is if you sequence a rice genome, the rice genome remains the same. But if you do a epigenome sequence that is the expressed portion of the genome or uh, the uh, uh, you know epigenome is uh, determined by the uh, cytosine DNA methylation and histone modifications that makes a part of the chromosome as uh, euchromatin or uh, het heterochromatin and uh, the euchromatin part is highly transcribed. So, this is highly dynamic process. So, every time depending upon the environment the uh, epigenome changes. So, in each tissue of the plant the genome is same, but the epigenome is not. So, in every environmental condition changes the epigenome changes that determine uh, rest of the entire worms. That is once the epigenome changes then transcriptome, proteome and all the worms changes finally, finally you see a different kind of phenotype. So, environment is interacting with the plant. Uh, continuously. So, if it is very important to understand uh, the phenome or monitor the phenome continuously as uh, many times as possible, so that you will be able to understand the contribution of genome in a given environment. This also require uh, uh, new methods, otherwise conventional methods are uh, rate limiting. So, that is why uh, it is uh, now uh, well accepted that uh, the phenotyping is uh, king and heritability is queen. So, the conventional method the limitation is that it is one is it is destructive and it is time consuming. So, if you want to know uh, the uh, uh, weight of the plant, so if you have given some input or you have large number of genotype, you want to know at 10 days, 20 days, 30 days you want to measure early vigor. So, you have to cut the plant and uh, take the weight it will take about uh, uh, 4 5 days. And even if you want to know say it is uh, metabolite content, say if you want to know nitrogen which is a very important uh, uh, metabolite. So, you want to measure nitrogen it will take additional week. So, you have a lot of week you have to spend more than uh, uh, 10 days. Finally, to know what is the phenotype 10 days back the plant was having. So, it not only involved time lapse, but also involve lot of uh, uh, like labor. So, that is why uh, we are unable to do uh, phenotype of a large number of uh, genotype and also it requires a lot of space, time and money. So, all this uh, limitation led to uh, the emergence of uh, new science which is called as uh, phenomics. Phenomics is defined as the acquisition of high dimensional phenotype data on organism uh, wide scale. So, like you are capturing the entire uh, uh, gene information uh, by using genomics, whether you can capture all the phenotypes by some or other uh, means. 
So, uh, unlike uh, uh, the uh, genomics, uh, capturing the entire uh, phenome is uh, very difficult, because as the environment change, the phenome changes and phenome consists of several things. It is from uh, the uh, molecule to the uh, structure of the plant which you see. So, it is not only related to the composition, it is also related to the performance. So, various traits are uh, involved, that is why capturing phenome information is uh, more uh, difficult, but you have to do it. So, uh, because of the uh, phenomics, uh, people think that now it will help in enhancing the uh, utility of genotype information in the uh, crop improvement. So, all the uh, this uh, phenomics, it uses non-invasive uh, sensors, uh, so that the information can be quickly and accurately captured and it can be quantified. So, conventionally when we uh, do any quantification, uh, for example, we use, uh, if you want to measure any analyte, we use a spectro, uh, radio, a spectrophotometer, where uh, we measure the absorption of an analyte and then we measure, uh, we know what is the concentration or depending upon the wavelength at which the analyte absorbs, we identify that this may be protein or this may be um, nucleic acid or uh, a different molecule. So, the non-invasive sensor which are commonly used in the non-destructive plant phenotyping is also use uh, this kind of principle wherein uh, the solar radiation or artificial radiation is uh, when it is falling on the plant. So, some of the radiation is absorbed, some will be transmitted and some are reflected. So, most of the sensors that we use in the uh, uh, phenomics or high throughput uh, phenotyping are reflectance based sensors. So, based on the reflectance, it, uh, we have to decipher what is the uh, structure composition of the plant. From that, we have to derive the trait. Uh, besides uh, these kind of sensor, uh, the uh, thermal imaging sensors mainly they use uh, the radiation emission from the object. And the other uh, kind of uh, sensor which are commonly used is the laser scanner, wherein a laser light is projected from the source. When it falls on the object, it is getting reflected. Based on this, it measures the shape of the object. So, measure, mainly this one is used to measure the height of the uh, plant or uh, biomass. So, there are large number of uh, uh, sensors are uh, being used in plant science. So, some of the most common ones are I uh, have uh, make it, uh, these are the common ones that is uh, fluorescent sensor or uh, the visible sensor. Visible sensor is uh, like our, uh, it is a, uh, the RGB camera which is the most commonly used uh, sensor for plant phenotyping and near infrared sensor. And uh, the hyperspectral sensors, are, they are very useful for uh, measuring the metabolite content and thermal sensor and chlorophyll fluorescence sensors, sensor. These are the, the most commonly used sensor. Besides this, bioluminescence and FTAR and MRI, these are also being used in plant sciences. So, uh, we have uh, these kind of sensors in our facility. So, we will see in brief about uh, what are uh, the sensor and what trait we can measure by using uh, this sensor. So, all these uh, sensors uh, can be mounted on uh, um, inside the greenhouse and the plants can be moved into the greenhouse and then we can take a uh, scan the plant and then we can get the information or the uh, sensors can be uh, put it in the uh, field and where the sensor can uh, record the phenotype information in the uh, field condition or we can put it on the drones and then we can quickly take the information from the field. So, we have uh, established uh, plant phenomic centers. So, ICR in 2010, it started establishing plant phenomic centers. So, in ICR uh, system, we have uh, four centers. One is in uh, Creda, uh, that is in Hyderabad, that was established uh, first. And the uh, other uh, center was established in the National uh, Institute for Abiotic Stress Management and one uh, center is there in the IEHR Bangalore and we have uh, one of the largest uh, facility uh, in the country. 
So, uh, in our center we have a climate controlled uh, greenhouse where uh, the plants are grown on the uh, conveyor system and uh, in on the conveyors you see different cars are there. So, these are RFID tagged. So, from the uh, time you keep the plant inside each plant is monitored and the data is recorded on the RFID chip. So, the data is uh, in the form of image. So, it is a permanent data. So, uh, the chances of mistakes uh, is uh, less and uh, even if you think that you have made some mistakes again you go back and look into the data. Otherwise, we manually record data and sometimes if you make mistakes sometimes you even when you measure the height of the plant you will uh, say 13.5 uh, the person who is writing you will write 30.5. So, so, some mistakes can happen. So, those kind of mistakes uh, will not be there and with the uh, conventional method once you record the data if the notebook is if you are working and if you uh, leave the uh, 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 job, you join somewhere, the data is uh, lost. So, otherwise we have generated large number of data, but if we see we do not have any archived data. So, in that way these kind of systems are useful. Once you capture the data, this data is permanently stored and which can be uh, analyzed for various uh, purpose, not only for the plant science, but also for uh, the computer science people. Uh, this data is very important data. And then uh, in each greenhouse daily these plants are weighed and watered. So, you know daily how much water it takes that is in the morning evening you measure the uh, total uh, transpiration both in the morning and evening. So, you can calculate how much water the plant uses. And these are the different sensors which we have and uh, these sensors are placed in the uh, imaging unit. So, once the uh, plants uh, goes in. Uh, the image is taken from the top and then from the side and the parts once it reaches the imaging unit it can be lifted and rotated in a different direction. So, unlike uh, the plants because they do not have a, uh, same structure in different sites. So, you have to capture information from the uh, different side to capture the entire information on the plant. So, can you run that video? जलवायु परिवर्तन फसलों की उत्पादकता के लिए एक ज्वलंत समस्या है भारतीय खाद्य सुरक्षा को बनाए रखने के लिए जलवायु अनुकूल फसल किस्में विकसित करना आवश्यक है इस लक्ष्य की प्राप्ति के लिए भारतीय कृषि अनुसंधान संस्थान ने एक अत्याधुनिक एवं स्वचालित प्लांट फिनोमिक्स केंद्र की स्थापना की है फिनोमिक्स एक आधुनिक बहु विज्ञान है जिसमें लगभग वास्तविक समय में पौधों को बिना क्षति पहुंचाए सेंसर्स एवं कंप्यूटर की सहायता से लक्षण प्रारूपण किया जाता है ये केंद्र हाईटेक नियंत्रित जलवायु वाले ग्रीन हाउस गतिशील फील्ड कन्वेयर सिस्टम स्वचालित भार उत्तोलन उर्वरक एवं सिंचाई स्टेशन और विभिन्न इमेजिंग सेंसर से सुसज्जित है ये केंद्र जलवायु अनुकूल फसल किस्में विकसित करने के लिए उपयोगी श्रेष्ठ जीन प्रारूपों एवं जीनों की पहचान करने के लिए प्रतिबद्ध है पद्म विभूषण से सम्मानित स्वर्गीय श्री चंद्रिका दास अमृत राव देशमुख जो एक महान सामाजिक कार्यकर्ता रहे हैं उनके सम्मान में आज इस केंद्र को भारत के माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी के द्वारा नाना जी देशमुख so, this is how the system works. So, if you have some time, so you, you can uh, visit the facility and uh, see how it works. So, uh, uh, when one, the one plant goes inside uh, this imaging unit, these are the number of images captured. So, normally in the thermal imaging unit, we take two images and in the uh, chlorophyll fluorescence there are 25 images like this about 741 images are taken at a single uh, point of time. So, normally in a crop about uh, 
uh, 9 million images are uh, captured. Besides that, we also record uh, transpiration data and uh, various weather data. These are very important because you have to know the environment at the uh, same point of the time. So, now we will see what we measure uh, in this uh, different uh, imaging uh, sensors, what is the uh, parameter which we uh, get from these imaging sensors. So, the RGB is the one most uh, commonly used and uh, daily we use uh, this uh, sensor. So, this uh, measures all the traits which we see by our eyes. So, it measures the uh, growth and deficiencies of uh, nutrient or water and it can measure the chlorophyll, it can detect the uh, stress, it can measure the yield. So, normally when we capture the image, uh, the image is uh, processed and then uh, only this uh, object of interest is uh, segmented out. Uh, from this we can measure what is the uh, area uh, occupied by uh, this image that is you know number of uh, pixels and uh, from by using various method you can uh, identify what is the, whether it is uh, green or it is yellow indicates uh, the senescence. So, you can see some leaves are yellow, some are green and as the stress is there most of the plant leaves are dry. So, you can quantify now by visually we can just say this plant is under stress and we will not be able to how uh, say exactly in this what is the amount of green leaf left and what is the uh, amount of green leaf is there and what is the uh, rate of senescence. So, all these things can be quantified uh, by uh, the uh, system. So, you can also say how many uh, panicles are there, everything can be counted automatically and besides that you know what is the chlorophyll content uh, uh, in this uh, plant, you can get the pixel wise information that is in the top or whatever in different leaf and uh, 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 panicle what is the chlorophyll content, this kind of information can be get, kept. Normally, it is very useful to predict the biomass, so which is very important, right. So, once you uh, uh, do the crop, uh, at what rate it uh, grows, that is very important. So, if, whether you impose any uh, stress or if you want to know the efficiency of the plant to different nutrient. So, measurement of rate of biomass gives a cumulative idea of how the uh, plant functions. So, uh, we can measure at frequent interval, normally in our facility we measure at uh, one in once in five days we measure uh, the uh, rate of growth of all the plants. So, you get the biomass information every five days from that you can calculate uh, different uh, growth rates that is relative growth rate or uh, the absolute growth rate, net assimilation rate, all these things tell about the physiological efficiency is of the plant. So, that will be very useful to identify uh, uh, the genomic regions that contribute to this physiological efficiencies, which was not possible by the conventional method. And also uh, applying input uh, to each plant is specific, that is since it is in a part you can exactly impose stress if you want to impose drought stress. So, in the field what we do if 200 genotypes are there, so we have to stop irrigation maybe uh, even if you put it in plot, maybe 10, 20 uh, genotype we put it in the same plot. When you normally do a genotype screening, mostly we use augmented design. So, only uh, two lines, three lines per genotypes are there. So, many genotypes are in a single plant and they have a lot of uh, phenological diversity. So, it is difficult to impose uh, stress at specific point of time. Even when you apply nutrient, you apply nutrient, so uh, you do not know uh, the amount of nutrient applied is equally accessible to all the plant or uh, not. So, all these limitations can be overcome in this kind of uh, system. So, you, you know for each plant you can add the same amount of input and then you can monitor all this uh, trait. So, you can exactly quantify the response here in this system. So, normally uh, uh, for in all these senses whatever I described, it is important to establish the relations with actual measurement at least once for each crop. So, that if you, you know exactly your system is measuring and it is giving the correct reading. That is you measure uh, the, the projected suit area and then you see that how it is related to the actual leaf area or how it is related to the, uh, the biomass of the crop. So, depending upon the uh, plant species, this relationship will 
change. Like here if you see, uh, if you want to measure the leaf area, you can see many of the leaves are overlapping. So in the wheat, uh, uh, this is wheat plant, so it looks less. If it is rice plant, there will be lot of overlapping. So that is a challenge. How will you address that challenge? Uh, how to measure exactly uh, uh, the leaf area. So there a lot of uh, uh, computer science work is required. So first uh, uh, it has be some machine learning application should be used so that uh, the machine recognizes whether it is a leaf or it is a panicle. And uh, if it can recognize all the leaves, whether it can extrapolate uh, the leaf tips in most cases. Uh, uh, you can you can visit it is visible only the base part is overlapped in uh, many plant structures so even if you uh, know the tip of the leaf then you know uh, you, whether you can project it to the base and then you, by using a computational method whether you can calculate all the leaf area so these are the some of the challenges now uh, the uh, people are working on and also you can automatically detect uh, the uh, panicle and uh, the stem so these are some of the work which is in progress. So otherwise for uh, this is only about it takes about uh, 45 seconds the plant goes in and uh, it comes out of the chamber you can get all this information. Otherwise uh, by conventional method it is very difficult to get all this information. You can also measure uh, the chlorophyll only you have to standardize because uh, the um, visual image contain uh, red, green and blue band you measure uh, this uh, pixel information and then you can convert uh, them into chlorophyll content. For that uh, a method was standardized wherein you uh, take the image of the leaf with uh, different chlorophyll content and then you prepare a model to uh, know what is the relations between the, uh, the pixel value and the chlorophyll content. Uh, similarly, you can also uh, see uh, how the stress affects the plant that can be also predicted. So when you uh, take the, uh, the RGB image, the RGB image is uh, analyzed in the uh, lapse color space wherein uh, the, uh, in each pixel how uh, the color is distributed. That is the, uh, in each pixel the color can be either green or red or in between the various uh, shades or it can from the uh, uh, this uh, blue to yellow and all these shades are blue to yellow and uh, the, uh, the intensity from white to black. So everything can be analyzed, you get information for every bin that is uh, how it changes can be monitored. So you see in this picture uh, the bin value for one particular bin is given. So when uh, the RWC is high, uh, this value is high as the uh, uh, the uh, stress increases, the bin value decreases. So based on this we can uh, identify the stress level in the plant. And also for uh, knowing the deficiency symptom, this is very important in the uh, like uh, uh, field condition where uh, you want to know the deficiency, you want to apply the uh, corrective measure. So for that once you uh, uh, take the image and uh, train the machine to identify whether it is uh, nitrogen deficiency symptom or it is uh, the iron deficiency or it is phosphorus deficiency. Once it is uh, trained, uh, then uh, it can be automatically say what is the uh, extent of deficiency and then uh, you can use uh, the corrective measures accordingly. So uh, the uh, identification of uh, the uh, years is one of the uh, challenge. So uh, one of uh, the student who was uh, from the IESRA he worked with us and he has developed uh, an algorithm to identify the year parts. That is once you take the image, uh, the image is processed, he has used lot of uh, machine learning algorithm to uh, separate the ears from the rest of the plant. So once processed, only the ear part will be visible and then it can be easily counted and detected. The uh, second imaging system we have in the facility is chlorophyll uh, fluorescence imaging. Uh, you know that uh, the, uh, when the light falls on the chlorophyll, it uh, absorbs some of the light and it gives fluorescence at a longer wavelength. So uh, some of the light energy is converted into uh, photochemistry to produce uh, ATP and NADPH and some is uh, dissipated as heat and some is emitted as fluorescence. So in the, uh, when the photochemistry is fully saturated, if you can measure the fluorescence, you can measure the 
health of the photo system. So, that is what uh, is done in the facility. So, uh, you keep the plants in the dark for about uh, 15 minutes, so that the all the electron transport uh, chain or the electron acceptor is uh, fully open. And then a saturating pulse of uh, light is given to fully saturate uh, the uh, electron acceptors, so that the rest of the excess light can be emitted as fluorescence. So, if you uh, take an image, uh, these are the kind of images you get from the uh, uh, fluorescence image measurement, where uh, you can uh, easily distinguish the plants which are uh, tolerant and uh, sensitive. So, these are uh, the rice plants, two rice plants uh, genotypes kept in the same pot. Uh, one is the normal uh, wild type rice plant and another one is the same genotype transformed with uh, one of the uh, ABA receptors. And when we subject this plant to the stress uh, after uh, when the soil reaches to about minus 90 kilopascal stress, uh, the fluorescence image was taken and this plant retained fluorescence and this plant lost, lost all set fluorescence. So, it says that uh, the photosystem um, is getting damaged in the other plant more quickly than in the um, a tolerant plant. So, you can quantify uh, this for uh, uh, different genotype to get how the electron transport system is uh, sensitive or uh, tolerant to different kind of input and other stresses. Besides the chlorophyll fluorescence, fluorescence can also be measured in other uh, wavelengths. So, these are uh, the natural fluorescence measured in the blue range, in green range and different ranges are measured. And these are used for uh, mainly uh, identification of some of the biotic stresses. This is an example, One, uh, they have standardized that uh, by using uh, the fluorescence at 440 and fluorescence at uh, uh, 520 wavelength, you can uh, detect a disease uh, in the plant. That is, this is the visible image of the uh, a leaf and where they have inoculated uh, uh, the uh, soft rot uh, fungi in different places. Then after that, uh, they took image. So, you can uh, see like uh, the uh, very clearly the symptom development uh, before it happens. You can see there is a change in the uh, uh, chlorophyll fluorescence or the autofluorescence in that particular place and then you can identify that disease. The uh, other important sensor which is commonly used in the plant phenotyping is uh, thermal imaging. So, thermal imaging is very important to measure uh, the plant water status and plant water status if you measure it is an uh, important indicator of the plant health whether any water deficit stress is there or not it will indicate. And uh, the plant temperature also tells about the stomatal conductance. So, unlike uh, human being where we maintain a particular body temperature, uh, plant uh, they cannot maintain any specific temperature. So, the temperature of the plant depends upon the air temperature and the rate of transpiration. So, as the water evaporate from the plant, so because of the evaporative uh, cooling, the tissue temperature uh, decreases. So, normally the plant temperature is lower than the air temperature if sufficient water is available. So, the extent of different depends upon the stomatal conductance. So, you indirectly infer about stomatal conductance and uh, uh, photosynthesis and also various biotic and abiotic stresses. So, thermal in thermal imaging mainly we measure uh, the uh, radiation emission in the range of 8 to 13 uh, micrometer. So, if, if you measure uh, the amount of radiation emitted, you can calculate the temperature by using the uh, relationship uh, given by the Stephen Boltzmann law. So, uh, once you take the image, you can very clearly see where uh, the, um, the stomatas are open in the uh, different plants and where it is closed, you can get really a very clear idea of, about temperature. So, this is uh, highly um, uh, predictable that is it is almost the correlation is 1 to 1. So, you can exactly predict what is the temperature once you get the uh, thermal image value. So, you can see what is the temperature in the uh, panicle or in the leaf and different part of the canopy can be easily identified. So, normally uh, uh, earlier method where uh, the only infrared thermometer was available to measure. 
uh, we are unable we were unable to get the information on uh, the temperature whether uh, it is panicle or it is coming from the leaf or it is coming from the background so with the thermal imaging you can easily uh, get the information on the pixel wise so that you know uh, uh, the temperature differences in the uh, various uh, tissues which is a uh, lot of genetic variability is available so this one is uh, one is to identify the genotypic variability and other one is to use this for uh, the uh, irrigation scheduling in the uh, field condition which is one of the uh, common uh, automated irrigation scheduling principle which is used in uh, large farms in uh, developed countries wherein by measuring the uh, temperature of the canopy temperature of the air and temperature of the uh, well watered uh, canopy and temperature of the drought canopy they calculate uh, the crop water stress index so once you calculate the crop water stress index you know for each crop there is a sensitive value beyond which the yield is going to decrease so you know uh, for many crops these values are known so once you uh, the crop reaches that particular crop water stress index we can automate the irrigation that is uh, the sensors can automatically activate uh, the irrigation control system and then the irrigation can be given in the field it is also uh, being used in the uh, uh, disease uh, detection that is uh, 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 the temperature is measured from the leaf and then they see that in the infected region uh, the temperature is higher when compared to the region which is not infected so these are uh, some of the effort in this direction but it will be like uh, 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 needs lot of uh, standardization to know uh, what kind of disease maybe a different kind of disease infection can also give rise to uh, the same temperature uh, change we have a nir imaging sensor so this sensor mainly measures the reflectance from 900 to 1700 nanometer as a single band so in this uh, mainly in this range we have one of the water absorption band so around 1500 nanometer water absor absorbs uh, the uh, near infrared radiation so if the uh, tissue is having more water content uh, it will uh, uh, give re uh, less reflectance and if this is having less water content more reflectance will be there based on that we can measure uh, the uh, relative water content so there, this is an important indicator of uh, the water status of the plant so if it is uh, well watered crop it will be about uh, 90 or uh, more than 90 and if uh, the value decreases to about uh, 70 or less than that in many cases the incipient plasma lysis takes place so plant loses turgidity and most of the metabolism is stopped so conventionally to measure this we take a uh, lot of time so by using this we can quickly measure uh, the uh, uh, last but the most important uh, sensor uh, available in the uh, high throughput plant phenotyping is the hyperspectral sensor so in this sensor uh, the reflectance is measured from 4000 nanometer to 2500 nanometer so you get reflectance for each nanometer uh, uh, reflectance so in this uh, sensor we get only uh, one reading that is if you uh, uh, see the plant for each pixel only one value will be there that is the total reflectance from 900 to 700 nanometer so in this uh, hyperspectral reflectance you get reflectance for each of the nanometer you get a uh, range of reflectance for each nanometer so this information is very useful so you know uh, different molecules they absorb in a specific wavelength range, uh, range. so you can correlate uh, the reflectance uh, to that specific molecule and then you can predict different uh, biochemical uh, molecule by using uh, this hyperspectral reflectance so this is an example of uh, uh, the hyperspectral reflectance data for uh, the rice variety with uh, different relative water content you see the lot of variation in the reflectance based on that you can easily measure the relative water content and quickly say which plant is under stress or not stress and also you can quantify uh, besides the stress you can also quantify the uh, nitrogen content uh, so this is uh, 
uh, for different genotype it is given as a pictorial as well as in the graphical representation. So, in some genotype when uh, no nitrogen is there we see that the uh, NDVA values uh, they decrease and most of these values are coming in red color whereas, in the control plan uh, they are in a green range. But some genotype they maintain uh, this uh, uh, nitrogen content even under the uh, deficiency condition. So, you can also quantify and see uh, what genotype they maintain uh, the nitrogen status and also you can see what leaves whether it is uh, 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 what kind of uh, leaves it is getting senes, uh, faster and you can make all the quantification. It can also be used for uh, distinguishing the different uh, genotype like if you have in the field large number of genotype. So, the genotype can be distinguished based on the reflectance. So, in this case uh, in rice um, by using the reflectance at this uh, wavelength this protein genotype can be distinguished very accurately. And also uh, this uh, method can be used to measure uh, the uh, soluble carbohydrates uh, such as uh, reducing sugar or it is uh, total sugar starch many metabolites people have tried to measure by using the uh, this hyperspectral uh, reflectance. And more importantly uh, recently uh, uh, various uh, nutrient uh, status of the uh, plant can be uh, measured by using hyperspectral reflectance image. So, uh, this is this shows the relations between the predicted uh, nitrogen content versus uh, the actually measured nit <coughs> nitrogen content. So, this is in soybean and maize plant they have attempted and almost in uh, for uh, different nutrient not only nitrogen, phosphorus, potas and almo and all the uh, macronutrient and also for uh, several micronutrient it has been standardized. So, uh, this uh, hyperspectral reflectance can also be used to uh, monitor the post harvest uh, quality. And uh, uh, this is an example uh, for uh, the protein content uh, in the wheat. So, the this you can see the genotype with the different protein content and the reflectance pattern based on this you can predict what is the actual protein content in the wheat. So, in addition to that you can also know where the protein content within the grain is more whether it is in the germ region or in the endosperm region that also you can exactly map. So, it the mapping is very accurate and if you see the values which are given in the white and uh, one value is given in the darker color. So, one is uh, predicted and the other one is measured. So, it is almost uh, matching. So, now these methods are uh, being used for uh, uh, mapping QTLs. So, this is an example from rice. So, the protein content measured by using uh, the hyperspectral reflectance. Uh, was used to do an association uh, mapping and actually measured protein content also was used in association mapping. You can see that these two QTL which are predicted by protein content is also uh, predicted by uh, the method which is uh, based on the hyperspectral reflectance. So, uh, in the uh, um, in the hyperspectral range uh, many uh, pigments and uh, the important uh, nutritionally important pigments such as beta carotene and anthocyanin they have uh, uh, different absorption spectra. So, uh, you know the absorption spectra of anthocyanin and beta carotene. So, you can use the reflectance from this uh, region to uh, predict the uh, nutrient content of uh, the plant. So, this is an example where uh, uh, it is being used in the grape orchard the hyperspectral uh, reflectance imaging. So, once the image is uh, taken uh, in the field by using uh, this method it can be processed to calculate the uh, TSS as well as anthocyanin content. So, you know at what uh, stage these grapes need to be harvested whether it is in the right stage for harvesting. Besides uh, the hyperspectral reflectance is also being used for uh, the detection of disease. So, you can see that this is the uh, stripe rust infection in wheat and at different stages uh, post inoculation the reflectance reading was taken and uh, see the lot of uh, difference in the uh, reflectance pattern specifically at this range which is used to measure the disease. 
besides it is also important in the field condition to know what disease is it is so that you can uh, um, um, say the infection is because of whether it is rust or any other disease. So, uh, many people have attempted to see whether the hyperspectral reflectance can distinguish different diseases. It says yes, uh, these are the reflectance pattern for the healthy leaf and for uh, the uh, infected with uh, three different diseases. Uh, it appears that in many regions there is a uh, lot of uh, possibility to <coughs> differentiate uh, the diseases. So, now uh, uh, there are a lot of efforts are being made to use uh, these kind of sensors, so that you can map uh, in the field where a specific disease is there, so that you can uh, apply uh, plant protection measures only in those regions. So, these are some of the example wherein uh, people have tried to use hyperspectral reflectance for detecting uh, different diseases as well as uh, insects such as BPH. So, all these sensors uh, can also be put in the, uh, the uh, uh, drone. So, nowadays uh, this is an uh, important application coming in for not only the uh, plant phenotyping, but also for uh, the uh, precision agriculture. So, where uh, like the huge field can be image within uh, 5 minutes that is our field is about 2 acres, it takes about 5 minutes to take uh, the uh, image of the field. So, once you take the image then this image can be uh, processed depending upon the sensor you use. So, these are just for example, I have given different uh, uh, treatment in the field. So, in each uh, this is I n 120 is this is the uh, control field control plot and this is a drought plot where the nitrogen was given. So, this is a drought plot, drought plus no nitrogen, this is only nitrogen deficiency. You can clearly see the differences in the treatment and also you can quantify uh, the biomass in uh, different uh, treatment conditions. So, once it uh, flies on the field, you get all this uh, quantitative information. Uh, although there are lot of uh, um, uh, efforts are being made to make the accurate estimation. Now, if you measure uh, it gives uh, uh, the uh, estimation may be accu accuracy of the estimation may vary with the stage. So, in the early stages of the crop where the overlap and other uh, uh, interferences are, are less, so you get the prediction better. As the crop grows say for example, if it uh, reaches flowering stage, after flowering stage uh, normally in our uh, this uh, crops there is no expansion of the pixel number is not going to change, only the grain weight is, uh, once the year comes after that only the grain is going to fill. So, there is no increase in the pixel, but the plant is gaining biomass. So, those kind of uh, uh, limitations will be there, but uh, uh, these are uh, various approaches are being used to overcome these limitations. Besides using the uh, non-invasive sensor, uh, there are efforts are also being uh, made internationally to develop a wearable sensor. So, uh, many of the uh, people wear, although not at your age, at our age people wear <laughs> some watch or some gadgets in our uh, this one. So, to monitor uh, the BP or blood sugar and or, uh, how much uh, kilometer we walk. So, all this information can be obtained by the wearable gadgets. So, whether uh, the plants can also have uh, the similar ones already uh, work is in progress internationally. So, this is a uh, tattoo sensor, it is very thin uh, uh, sensor. Uh, so, this one can be attached to the maize leaf, it will continuously uh, tell about uh, the uh, water transpired by the plant. So, it can continu continuously send the information to the data logger. So, the other one is also like to monitor the plant growth, there are uh, thin film metal uh, strain sensors are uh, being developed. So, all these uh, sensors can be uh, highly useful for uh, uh, the plant phenotyping, that is you get uh, the entire information about the environment phenotype and you have the genome information and the large amount of data analytics uh, goes in. Um, and then finally, you get the, the output and this is also a kind of uh, a future forms, they say although in already a lot of drone application is uh, being made in other countries, India also going in a big way, 
to use uh, the unmanned aerial vehicles or drones for various uh, precision agriculture op operation or uh, crop, crop health monitoring. So, this is again expected for all these things required better understanding of uh, the image based sensors and uh, what is the relation between the sensor data to the actual phenotype. So, uh, you have to do a lot of work to establish a model or a correlation between the, uh, the uh, image based data as well as uh, to the actual phenotype data. So, uh, that is all this is uh, almost my uh, the last but one slide. So, it is very important uh, to ask uh, the uh, important research question, otherwise uh, it is the question that uh, gets you the Nobel Prize after that you just add lab coats, coffee and air conditioning. So, you have to uh, uh, read well and ask important research question. So, then after that even if you have facility or if you do not have facility, I think you can make uh, important research contribution. So, finally, I thank uh, uh, the uh, phenomics teams, large number of people are involved in the establishing the facility as well as uh, 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 operationalizing this facility start starting from our uh, director general to all our uh, project staff and uh, my uh, uh, fellow colleagues who have contributed to establishing this particular facility. And also uh, please uh, conserve water, water is very important uh, uh, natural resource and uh, if you uh, solve the problem, what problem of water you will get two Nobel prizes, one for science and one for peace. So, this is such an important commodity, so we have to conserve water either uh, through plant bedding means you produce an efficient plant or by crop management you develop a system so that crops use less water because agriculture uses about 80 percent of the water, fresh water which is used by the human beings. So, we have lot of opportunity to save water in agriculture, so we have to strive for it. Thank you very much. So, now if you have any queries, any questions, please come in front and ask. Good morning, sir. It is a very fruitful session for me. Sir, myself, Dhruv Inwadi from Anand Agriculture University. My question is that uh, there is any system for biochemistry like uh, we study all uh, pathways from phenotics? So, at present, uh, you can measure different metabolites, uh, but pathway analysis, like you have to measure in a pathway, if you measure all the metabolites, then you will be able to uh, re reconstruct the pathway and study. So, at present, there is no system that it will say about how a specific pathway is being operated, but you can measure maybe uh, reducing sugar and uh, total sugar starch and based on that if you measure in large number of plant at the same time see if you have also measured the photosynthesis by using infrared gas analyzer. So, this kind of large amount of data can be used to see uh, the probable uh, rate of photosynthesis or uh, the predict only prediction can be made, no, but not actually you can measure the pathway, but still lot of work is in progress. Not all the metabolite can be quantified by using non-invasive sensor, only some metabolites people have standardized. So, maybe in future uh, some sensors will come to detect the entire uh, pathway or uh, different pathway if it operates in the leaf, how it works. Thank you, but sir. many uh, important uh, metabolites can be uh, measured by using this method. Okay. Thank you, sir. And th second question is, uh, what are the small and tools and sensor which farmers can use? See, uh, currently uh, the sensors which are uh, uh, say small or cheaper one is the infrared uh, thermal sensor is small and the chlorophyll concentration measurement is a small sensor. But normally, uh, the when it comes to application, uh, it is uh, because India is having lot of small farmers, people uh, may or may not use it. 
So, that is why uh, now uh, it is uh, uh, the concept of uh, Hustom carrying uh, type of uh, concept is coming in where uh, say in a village uh, may be one person will have a drone and he will have the sensor and he will just fly on the village, he will get the data for the entire village and he can say uh, these are the operations has to be done or this particular pest is there in the field you make spray. So, those kind of system may start because now uh, and the recently in the government program on the startups many of the young graduates uh, uh, they are uh, like planning for this mm. although it needs lot of research, but I am sure in 3, 4 years this kind of system will be in place. So, farmer either he can use his own <coughs> sensor if he is like uh, if it is uh, the uh, grape vine yard or it is big orchard, those farmers uh, may buy their own sensor and they may use. Even our small farmers, they are not uh, like able to afford even the soil moisture sensor and other sensor to buy and use it. Mm -hmm. So, in those cases either on community basis or from the as a government service, if this can be started, then it will be more useful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, sir, for the talk. It was really impressive. Uh, my question is, can you give us brief insight in uh, uh, livestock uh, phenomics, if you have some idea regarding it? Mm, uh, actually, uh, people are uh, trying to use in uh, livestock, I think NDRI has done some work on heat detection in animal by using uh, thermal imaging. And also they use uh, the wearable sensors like uh, use some gadget in the uh, neck. So, based on the, I think uh, the, um, uh, the movement of uh, mouth, they calculate how much feed it takes. So, this kind of application is there, but I have not uh, looked into the animal ones. But now, uh, even in uh, fisheries, uh, like in IRI, one uh, startup company is there, uh, they want to take images in the underwater uh, to monitor the health of the fish. And if there is any disease, uh, is there by using uh, the hyperspectral and the visual camera. So, there are lot of people are working on it. So, I have not collected much information on that, but I am sure uh, it is uh, even more useful in uh, animal sciences where uh, like in the industrial uh, type of like dairy or uh, even when uh, the animals are grown for uh, other purpose, they are grown in a more controlled uh, condition in many of the other countries. So, I am sure it has lot of application. Any idea in small animal phenomics? Uh, I do not have any idea because I have not actually looked into it, but mm. uh, I think that is more commercially uh, required mm. because majorly uh, the products and uh, whatever the drugs are getting formed, they are tested on small animals first of all. So, they are much more important if we develop some phenomics. See, there. actually, it will be there. I have not uh, uh, like collected those information because the phenomics started with human uh, genome only. Once the human genome uh, they completed, they only started the uh, phenomics project. So, uh, I am sure that mostly this uh, census for many of the animal systems will be available. Thank you, sir. Yes, Ria. Thank you, sir, for bringing this topic in next generation phenotyping. So, my question is, my question is, sir, can we avoid uh, chlorophyll estimation using the DMSO or that using the spectrophotometric or SPAD uh, and using uh, fully depending on the this technique? Yeah, chlorophyll estimation is one of the easiest one that you can estimate by using for visual large image for any number of sample. Mm -hmm. If it is the for the live plants, you can easily uh, measure by using uh, the hyperspectral imaging and mm -hmm. by using the visual image. Yes, accurately. 
Yeah, accurately it is. Okay. See, accurately means like in the germplasm, so you want to know uh, the uh, chlorophyll uh, uh, content if we have uh, 300, 400 genotype, you want to quantify and assign some value. So, the accuracy depends upon the model you uh, develop. So, in I, I have shown in that one the accuracy was about 0 0.85, uh, the R square value was about 0.85. So, it is for relative measurement, uh, it is mainly we are using it for relative, relative measurement. So, what is there in the healthy crop and what is uh, will be the value in the non healthy crop. So, if you want to say accurately so many milligram per gram fresh leaf, uh, that may have limited accuracy, that is about 0.85. Otherwise, for classification, it is highly accurate. You can distinguish uh, different uh, concentration plants with different concentration, you can easily distinguish. So, Thank it will you. have about uh, uh, with the visual, you can have about 0.8 uh, R square value. If you are using hyperspectral, uh, the accuracy goes high because you know exactly. Uh, the pigment absorbs in what region and you can take the reflectance of only those specific regions to calculate the uh, uh, pigment content. So, any pigment, uh, these methods are very useful. Thank you. So, uh, you want to ask a question, please come. So, that is good that this new dimensions here, today all are so <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, really uh, impressive talk on uh, next generation phenotyping. I really uh, very much impressed by your uh, uh, work and facilities available at uh, IRF Unomics Center. Uh, I, uh, it is not questions, sir. actually I want some clarifications sure. regarding uh, drought works. Okay. Uh, since the drought is a complex state controlled by many genes and many factors like climate change uh, uh, factors, uh, that uh, Drought. The the what is the reliability of the results obtained in the uh, control conditions or the phenomic centers at uh, uh, field level? Because uh, we are controlling uh, almost all the factors uh, uh, at the phenomic uh, at the control phenotyping center, and we are only varying a uh, few one or two or only few uh, factors, uh, and uh, we are ex we are allowing the genotype to exploit uh, to express all the full fledged. Uh, content in that. Uh, in this uh, context, uh, uh, what amount of the uh, or results obtained at uh, control conditions are reliable in at field condition? And is one time is one time phenotyping is uh, sufficient for uh, uh, recommendation of the particular genotype to the uh, particular area for particular climatic conditions? So, uh, uh, see, as you said, it is really drought is a, a complex uh, uh, phenomena because uh, the rate of stress development and uh, the uh, VPD differences and the stage at which it occurs, many things it uh, complicates the process. So, uh, the main idea of uh, controlled environmental phenotyping is to minimize the other environmental variable and keep only one factor. Uh, as a stress factor. So, this is mainly uh, done to uh, identify the genomic region. So, if where uh, the when G into E is uh, high in the field condition to map the same gene you have to do maybe multiple years of uh, experiment and ultimately you may not be able to identify that particular uh, G component for that environment. So, in the control environmental phenotyping because you are uh, controlling the E, the heritability of uh, the trait increases. So, it is used to map the genomic region. So, then when you uh, map the genomic region, you use multiple genomic region that is important for stress. So, you are enhancing the performance of the plant under the field condition. So, uh, then other one is uh, say in the uh, field condition, it is very difficult to uh, measure uh, water use efficiency, we will not be able to measure. So, in the uh, controlled environment facility, you can identify the genotype which are more water use. So, that one will apply in the field also. Like we identified some of the genotypes which are uh, having high water use, so this, their performance will be similar. But if you apply stress in the our facility versus in the field, our facility mainly uh, me uh, measures the tolerance level at a uh, given stress. So, in this we restrict the uh, root growth. 
So, in the uh, this is because in the pot it is about uh, 40 to 50 centimeter height. So, when it goes to the field uh, in those when you apply drought, uh, the genotypes mostly we select which avoid drought stress that is which have deeper root system or it can take up water from the deeper layer of the soil. So, that is not the only mechanism of drought tolerance. So, the, that is one of the mechanism that is growing more deeper root. So, by the time the genotype which has deeper root it will take up more water and it will uh, stay healthy. Whereas, the, the other genotype which have other mechanism either it has better water use efficiency or it has better stomatal control or it has uh, better cellular tolerance. Those genotypes are difficult to identify in the field condition. That is why if you do it in the phenotyping you will always see C306 may be performing better in the wheat or Nagina 22 may be performing better in the rice because they produce deeper root whereas they may have less water use efficiency when compared to the other genotype. So, uh, it is not that only one phenotyping system is a solution to everything. This is mainly for uh, uh, mapping genes it is very good because you are controlling uh, different factors you can quickly map uh, the uh, genomic region. Otherwise, in the field phenotyping it is not possible because you are you will not be able to give drought stress to all the genotype at the same level. Is there uh, since uh, almost 10 years of work has been carrying out from in the from center, is there any success stories uh, regarding this uh, drought uh, conditions? So, uh, we started only in uh, 2017 we started uh, this facility. So, uh, now we have mapped some of the QTL for uh, 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 rice and wheat for water use efficiency and uh, uh, drought tolerance in uh, by using recombinant inbred lines and uh, by using uh, the uh, uh, germplasm by using GVAS. So, now we will uh, we have to see when we uh, deploy these QTLs how it is going to perform and we also identified some of the uh, like uh, genotypes in rice uh, which use uh, less water in the night time and more water in the day time. So, uh, uh, otherwise conventionally uh, we do not know even uh, what is the variation in the water use by different rice genotype. So, now we have identified uh, genotypes donors and the QTLs. So, now we have to see how to use this for uh, improving the water use and productivity. So, already some effort is in progress in this direction. Uh, thank you for your informative talk, sir. My doubt is, uh, when we are talking about the sensors, you have discussed about the above ground part uh, region. Is there any sensor to measure the below ground part region, especially the medium that is soil, uh, especially the physiochemical property of soil and the nutrient status of the soil? So, uh, uh, actually some electrochemical sensors are available uh, for uh, soil measurement. And also uh, the hyperspectral sensor uh, they have standardized for uh, the uh, soil organic carbon measurement and also for other nutrient they are uh, trying to standardize. Uh, the main problem with this uh, non-invasive sensors are uh, they mainly capture the surface property. So, in soil maybe the surface layer uh, only is not, not only the surface layer, but the other layer is also important. So, for that mainly uh, some electrochemical sensors are very important, lot of work is in progress uh, even within the country in other places also to develop soil sensor. But these sensors mainly only the hyperspectral sensor uh, has been standardized, uh, Dr. Sagu from agriculture physics division, he uses this sensor for mapping the soil organic carbon and uh, some of the nutrients. So, some work is in progress. Thank you. Uh, please come. Sir, really it is a good presentation and I got, uh, every time I am uh, listening to your presentation I am getting something different from it. Right. Sir, uh, now I am uh, want to ask you, you have shown one slide that uh, uh, in protein, uh, protein uh, contain measurement in uh, grain, mm. sir, how, how it will uh, measure it and what is the mechanism behind See, it? See, uh, many of the, uh, uh, the hyperspectral uh, reflectance based measurement, uh, 
it is not only like normally protein content you see if you take in spectrometer 280 nanometer you take one absorption and we measure so hyperspectral sensors they uh, measure the reflectance at uh, the whole wavelength from 350 to 2500 nanometer and then you measure the actual protein content and do uh, a statistical analysis of each wavelength or combination of two wavelength combination of different wavelength and then you find out what are the different wavelength that is contributing to the protein content. So, it is not uh, exactly based on the absorption of uh, that protein at a specific wavelength. So, it is multiple wavelength how the reflectance changes because of the change in the protein content from that that value is inferred. So, uh, if you measure uh, this method for maybe rice, you cannot say that the exact model you cannot use it for wheat you have to standardize for wheat and maybe for leaf you have to use a different model and for grain you have to use a different model. So, at every of uh, this uh, sensor you have to develop a relational model with the actual measurement once. So, once you develop that then you can do it for a large number of uh, sample. Sir, uh, when we are doing it manually huh? and by this uh, sensor, using, sir, is there any difference or similar they are better than this manual? No, better than the manual <laughs> will not be there, but it will be like near to that say about uh, in many cases it is about uh, R square value is about 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.85 that is all. So, it is it cannot be better than a manual method. So, for that if you use see the absorption based uh, methods will be always better than the reflectance based method. These are all reflectance based methods. So, it is not it as I told some uh, the light is absorbed some is transmitted and only some is reflected. So, the reflectance not only depends upon the absorption it also depends upon the structure and uh, cell thickness various and other uh, parameters. So, it will have less accuracy uh, than the direct measurement, but it it is as accurate as direct measurement when you want to rank. So, in this all the 100 people if you want to identify uh, and rank them 1 to 100 that can be ranked by these methods. So, that is important uh, in many cases if you are using either uh, 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 the QTL mapping or if you are monitoring the plant health. So, that is sufficient because you want to know some quantitative value each of them and this quantitative value is related to the actual value. So, in that way it, it works. I think uh, maybe, uh, so now we will not take uh, uh, any more question because today uh, we are going to have visit uh, at Nanaji Desmukh National Okay, 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 uh, okay And uh, you will be, okay, okay, uh, you will feel honored or pride to know that sir has established all those with his own ideas. And uh, uh, so today we will visit and whatever question and queries we have. So we have uh, uh, another scientist, Dr. Sudhir Kumar. So he will be answering your questions. So now I think uh, we started with epigenome and now we reached to phenome. So from king of grain, now we are at king of tools. And uh, the number of questions which you raised, so that proved that you thoroughly enjoyed this talk. So with this brief note, uh, really this, this is a pride moment for me also to felicitate my teacher. So I'll take this moment to felicitate Dr. Vishwanathan. So, so thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for coming and giving thank such so an interesting talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.